Hello, everybody. It's Jenny Sivy. So about a week ago, someone reached out to me on Twitter and asked me about duct pressure losses with and without turning veins. I thought it was a timely question because I'm about to follow the airflow out of the air handler and into the building. So let's talk about duct pressure today. In HVAC systems, we use fans to create pressure that moves air through the ductwork. Then we reduce the size of the ductwork throughout the system until the air is distributed into the space through grills and diffusers. The fundamental principle behind this is Bernoulli's principle. At its simplest, Bernoulli's principle says that for a fluid, when the velocity increases, the static pressure decreases, and if the velocity decreases, the static pressure increases. It's really fundamental to a lot of HVAC. The equation looks like this. P equals one half rho V squared plus rho G H is constant. So stay with me here. We're not going to do a lot of math because Bernoulli's equation took into account gravity, elevation, and density, but for our purposes we're going to ignore those. The simplified version of Bernoulli's equation looks like this, P plus Q equals P naught. P naught is the total pressure, Q is the dynamic pressure, also known as velocity pressure, and P is the static pressure. Let me make a little more room here. So now we have the equation TP equals VP plus SP, or total pressure equals velocity pressure plus static pressure. So when we have a piece of ductwork and let's say we have one inch of total pressure. And let's say it's made up of 0.4 inches of velocity pressure and 0.6 inches of static pressure. When it transitions to a smaller section, assuming no friction, your total pressure will stay one inch, but now maybe your velocity pressure went to 0.6 because it sped up, and your static pressure went to 0.4. Or the opposite is true if the airflow is moving in this direction. So maybe your static pressure would go from 0.4 to point 0.6, and this is called static regain. In my example, I assume there's no friction loss, but that's not obviously not how it works in real life. So let's look at that. There are three methods of duct design. Equal friction, static regain, and constant velocity. In the US, we usually use equal friction. I'll save the details about how these methods work for a future video. But when we design a duct system, we want to minimize energy usage, material, and installation time. Let me move this over to make some more room. Energy usage is a function of pressure loss. The higher the pressure loss, the bigger the fan and motor required for the system, and the more energy will be used. From a material standpoint, most of the building's ductwork is sheet metal, only switching to flex duct to connect to the diffusers. So ideally, you want to minimize your duct size to use as little sheet metal as possible. However, there's a trade-off between duct size and pressure loss that we'll talk about in a minute. The last consideration is installation time. Lots of elbows and tees and transitions can increase installation time, but often can't be avoided. Elbows and tees also increase pressure loss of the system, so they'll have effect on energy usage as well. So really both of these are related to pressure loss. So let's make a little more room and look at this further. The type of ductwork, size, and shape all affect pressure differently. The rougher the ductwork is, the more friction loss it'll have. So unlined ductwork will be less rough and therefore have lower friction loss 
than fiberglass line ductwork or flex duct. As far as shape goes, round ductwork will have less pressure loss than rectangular ductwork. This is because in round ductwork there is less surface area exposed to the airflow. For instance, if this is a 12 inch round ductwork and this is 12 by 9 inch rectangular ductwork, let's calculate the area. So for the circle, the area is pi r squared and r equals 6 which comes out to 113 square inches. And for the rectangle, it's length time height, which comes to 108 square inches. So pretty close. But now if we look at the surface area that the airflow will have contact to, that's two pi r for the circle, and that equals 37.7 inches. And for the rectangle, it's going to be 2 times length times height, and that will equal about 42 inches. So the rectangular actually had a smaller area for the airflow to pass through, but more surface area for more friction. The velocity of the air as it passes through the ductwork affects the pressure drop as well. Let's scoot this up a little. So let's say we have 2,000 CFM. So Q equals the area times the velocity. So velocity equals the CFM over the area. So in our circle, we're looking at 2,000 divided by 113 to four to get it into feet. Comes up with 2546 feet per minute. That equates to a velocity pressure, using the velocity pressure equation, of 0.4 which is velocity pressure is the square of velocity divided by 4,005 equals 0.4 inches. For the rectangle, the velocity will equal 2,000 divided by 108 divided by 144, which is 2,666 feet per minute. And then we can calculate the velocity pressure of that to about 0.44 inches, which is about 10% higher than in the round duct. You also have to consider the material and installation cost. Spiral duct may be less expensive and requires less sealing, so it may be a better option all around in this example. But what if you were comparing 24 inch spiral to a rectangular duct? In this case, you may not have enough sealing height to install the 24 inch spiral, so you would have to make a decision about using a less tall rectangular ductwork or a flat oval and that might be your best option. So let's make a little more room now. Talk about inlet and outlet transitions because inlets and outlets will affect the pressure loss as well. The more gradual the transition, the lower the pressure loss. If you have a transition that looks like this where it just abruptly changes to a smaller size, the airflow would move through it kind of like this. There'd be a lot of turbulence in this area where the transition happens, and there'd be a, the sudden change would cause higher pressure drop. This next transition, where it only transitions on one side, would have a lower pressure drop and would be better, or you could transition on both sides, and that would also be better. The one in the middle works best because you can keep the flat side to the ceiling and just raise the ductwork as you go. Same thing if you have to tap off on your duct work. An abrupt 90 degrees will give you a lot of turbulence and will be a poor from a standpoint of pressure loss. It would be better if you could transition like this middle one and best if you could do a soft transition completely. For elbows, a hard 90 will be your worst option because there'll be a lot of turbulence and pressure drop. Your next best option would be to put in turning vanes that would guide the air through the transition, and then your best option would be to have a soft 90.
Make a little more room one more time. And let's look at T's. Much less like 90 degree bends in and T off, you'll have a lot of turbulence here where the air is hitting this back side. If you could put in turning vanes, now this will help your airflow turn the corner and reduce your pressure loss. And then ideally you would have two soft 90s going in opposite directions for the lowest pressure loss. You really want to have a good balance between pressure and cost. These different pressure losses fall into two categories, frictional losses caused by the air moving through the ductwork and dynamic losses caused by disturbances to the airflow from changes in the area or direction. So that's a quick overview of duct pressure losses. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and thanks for watching.